Growing up as an atheist in a town full of Christians, it always annoyed me when people would ask me questions like, if you don't believe in God, what reason do you have to be a good person? Or, isn't your life meaningless without religion? It's not like I had great answers for those questions, but I didn't feel like I needed them. All that really mattered was that the answers the Bible gave weren't actually answers. They were just overblown fairy tales. And most other atheists seemed to feel the same way. The important part was that everyone else was wrong, not that we had it all figured out ourselves. It wasn't until I got to grad school that I learned that atheism actually does have good answers to those questions. They just come from a school of philosophy that most atheists either don't know about or even actively reject. It's called postmodernism. It just so happened that I was getting into postmodernism at the same time that it was experiencing a huge surge in political relevance. Unfortunately, that relevance had nothing to do with its value as a philosophy. Instead, it was driven by a wave of polemics like this. And we've been publicly funding extremely radical postmodern leftist thinkers who are hell-bent on demolishing the fundamental substructure of Western civilization. That's Canadian psychology professor Jordan Peterson. If Peterson's accusations were really about postmodern philosophy, it would be hard to explain why they found such a massive audience. But of course, Peterson's fans aren't interested in postmodernism. The thing that got their attention was the way he used postmodernism to prove a point they already believed but had a hard time justifying, that progressive social justice activism is misguided and dangerous. Peterson tells this story about how postmodernism turned academia against the West and spawned a generation of politically correct snowflakes. There are a couple things that make this story appealing to his fans. First, it lets them criticize progressives without admitting that they're against progress. How can they explain why they support rights for black people, but not trans people? Or giving women the right to vote, but not to equal pay? Easy. The good kind of social progress comes from the Western liberal tradition. The rest is postmodern neo-Marxist nonsense. But the real beauty of this story is that nobody knows enough about postmodernism to point out that it's just not true. And because so few people care about it, postmodernism makes a good target for people from a wide range of ideologies. Unfortunately, that includes atheists. Leading figures like Sam Harris have even joined forces with religious conservatives like Ben Shapiro to attack postmodernism. Along with Peterson and many others, they formed a strange alliance that calls itself the intellectual dark web. Their only common ground seems to be the paranoid belief that postmodernism has turned progressive activists into an existential threat to Western civilization. As absurd as that is, the growing popularity of Peterson and the intellectual dark web has forced progressives to defend themselves. The responses I've seen fall into two main categories. For the first, progressives stick with what they know, politics. They focus on exposing the intellectual dark web as a front for laundering bigotry, pointing out that Peterson boasted he would intentionally misgender his trans students, or that Sam Harris advocates racial profiling. Most importantly, they point out that the intellectual dark web in general provides a legitimating platform for extreme right-wing ideologies. The other approach is to defend postmodernism. That's more difficult, but it also gives you a lot more to say, so it's been fairly popular on YouTube. ContraPoints and Peter Coffin have both used this approach, and Cuck Philosophy has basically made it the whole mission of his channel. And of course, it's also the approach I'm taking in this video. But here's the difference. Those videos mostly focus on providing an alibi for postmodernism, refuting specific claims about its relationship with Marxism or identity politics, framing it as an attitude rather than a coherent body of ideas, and generally demonstrating that it can't be guilty because it wasn't capable of committing the crime. What I want to do is present postmodernism in a new way. I'm not just going to try and sell you on it by making it seem more appealing and approachable. Instead, I want to prove that if you strip away all the intellectual posturing and bad writing and weird opinions that are often associated with it, postmodernism is a relatively simple idea that also happens to be the best explanation we have of knowledge, truth, meaning, and morality. You might find it counterintuitive, and you might not like what it seems to imply, but like most revolutionary ideas about our place in the universe, once you get it right, a lot of other problems make a lot more sense. It may not often get credit for it, but postmodernism is a new solution to a problem philosophers had been stuck on for the last thousand years. How do we know things about the world? The answer is easy to summarize. Knowledge is social. But it's not obvious what that means, or why it took until the 20th century for someone to figure it out. Think of the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. Imagine I asked you to write a thousand words describing this picture. Do you think your description would be exactly the same as at least one other person's? It doesn't seem like a great gamble, does it? But what if I only asked for 10 words? That would be a much easier bet to take. In 10 words, there are only so many ways you can write a possum wearing a blue hoodie eating cauliflower on a chair. But why does that feel intuitive? If the picture really has a thousand words worth of information, 
how do you know anybody else would write their 10 words about the same parts of the picture as you? Well, it feels intuitive because we know that those 10 words aren't picked randomly. We all use the same set of rules and patterns to pick out recognizable elements. We know that a hoodie is a shirt with a hood and long sleeves, cauliflower is a white vegetable you can crunch, and an opossum looks like a small dog with star-shaped hands, moon petal ears, and a grab noodle on the back. We also know that opossums don't usually wear hoodies or sit on chairs, and unusual elements are worth describing. This is a fairly trivial thought experiment for humans. But getting a computer to do the same thing is still an unsolved problem in machine learning research. Computers can easily learn the color of every pixel in an image, but that doesn't actually get them very far because the description doesn't come from the colors in the picture. It comes from the patterns in the mind writing the description. Think about a book. If it's written in a language you can't read, the no descriptions you write of the curves and serifs of the letters will help you figure out what the words actually mean. But if you do know the language, then the meaning will be obvious. The same logic applies to the picture. No matter how many words you write, you won't figure out whether this opossum is healthy or not, or what mood she's in, unless you know enough about opossums to know what to look for. This is kind of the whole reason we say a picture is worth a thousand words in the first place. If you hand someone a picture, they might see things you weren't equipped to understand. What this means is that perception isn't just a one-way street, with information flowing from the world into our minds. We have to combine our experience with some prior notions in order to turn it into knowledge. And that raises the question, where do those prior notions come from? They can't just come from experiences themselves. No matter how many words you look at, you won't be able to understand a new language unless you can find something in it you already recognize. This is what makes the question, how do we know things about the world, so hard to answer. It's a problem that stumped some of the greatest thinkers in European philosophy. Immanuel Kant understood that you had to apply some ideas already in your mind to turn your experience of a thing into knowledge about it. But he thought some of those concepts were just so universally obvious they kind of showed up in our mind by default. David Hume wasn't satisfied with that. He thought every single concept had to ultimately be derived from experiences. But he still couldn't really explain how that happened. So even though people were thinking about this question hundreds of years ago, they couldn't come up with a good answer. Fortunately, the problem has gotten a lot easier since then. You see, we know about something they didn't. The theory of evolution tells us that perception isn't something rational beings do in order to better understand God's creation. It's a tool organisms developed to help them survive and reproduce. That goal is the missing piece that explains how we get from raw data to useful knowledge. It gives us a reason to choose between the millions of possible ways of interpreting our experience. A stone on the bottom of the river doesn't need to be aware of its surroundings because it has no way to respond to them. But a dragonfly nymph has to decide when and where to move in order to catch prey and avoid predators. The need to survive and reproduce turns the dappled light hitting the stream bed from the indifferent outcome of light physics into a map of life and death. An animal like a dragonfly combines dozens of patterns for recognizing things like predators and prey into a complete perceptual model of its surroundings. As some neuroscientists have put it, our brains hallucinate the world we live in. Because we share both our environment and the rules and patterns we use to perceive it with other people, our hallucinations form a consensus about what reality is really like. This is the broadest sense in which knowledge is social. The rules and patterns we use to model our world don't exist in the world itself, and they don't belong to any one individual. Like our genome, they're a property of our lineage. And just like our genome, natural selection optimizes those rules and patterns for completing its goals. So what does that have to do with knowledge in general? Animal perception is obviously the product of evolution towards the goals of survival and reproduction. But it seems absurd to say the same is true of math or physics. And yet, as profoundly as we might feel like there must be a difference, no matter how close you look, you'll never find one. Like the patterns of animal perception, words and concepts can't be derived from experiences because they don't exist in the world itself. They have to be inherited. In the same way that animal brains combine inherited patterns to hallucinate the world around them, humans integrate cultural concepts into a social construction of reality. And even though now we can use tools like science to build and sort new models ourselves, both the goals that guide our selection of better models and the tools we use to build them come from evolution. So as much as it feels like animal perception and human science are completely distinct entities, they're really root and branch of the same tree. The postmodern model of knowledge links the most advanced frontiers of human science to the most basic forms of biological perception. It lets us understand meaning, morals, and truth as natural phenomena that don't rely on deities or platonic forms. But despite all of its philosophical successes, it hasn't been widely adopted. And part of the reason for that is that people think the postmodern model leads to three unacceptable conclusions, subjectivism, solipsism, and relativism.
To some extent, this confusion is understandable. Words like hallucination and social construction have connotations that would make a lot of people hesitate to embrace postmodernism as a foundation for all knowledge. Fortunately, there's really nothing to worry about. It's true that postmodernism makes some major revisions to our ideas about objectivity and subjectivity. In fact, postmodernism changes our understanding of two different definitions of objectivity in two very different ways. We'll come back to the second one later, but for now I'm talking about this one, having reality independent of the individual mind. And by that definition, postmodernism makes knowledge even more objective than we normally imagine. If knowledge is composed of inherited building blocks, that means that those building blocks by definition transcend any individual. The rules of moral conduct, the definition of a triangle, and the criteria of artistic taste are all cultural traits shared across generations. They're not universal, and they're not necessarily correct or effective, and they're definitely not unchangeable. But they are objective, because they exist beyond the mind of any one person. The charge that postmodernism leads to solipsism is also fairly easy to refute. The patterns and ideas that compose our knowledge might not be derived from the world, but that doesn't mean they're cut off from it. They're like mills that process raw data into models. We only say, a possum wearing a blue hoodie eating cauliflower on a chair, when we see a picture that looks like this. More importantly, external reality drives natural selection, the most fundamental force shaping models to effectively achieve our goals. And that leaves relativism. On one hand, relativism is the most important implication of the postmodern model of knowledge. On the other, it's the most absurd caricature anybody tries to pin on it. The claim that truth is relative is the core of what makes Peterson and the intellectual dark web so adamantly opposed to postmodernism. They might not agree on whether it comes from science or religion, but everyone in the intellectual dark web believes that truth can be absolute. And that's important to them. Sam Harris thinks that if science can discover absolute moral truths, then everyone will have to listen to his opinions about Islam. If the gender binary is an absolute fact of the universe, then misgendering trans and non-binary people makes Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro bold truth-tellers. But the real truth of the matter is that whether truth is absolute or relative is a purely semantic question. Relative truth serves all the same practical purposes as absolute truth. It just doesn't sound quite as impressive. As with objectivity, a big part of the confusion is that there are two contradictory definitions of the word that both seem relevant here. In the pejorative sense, relativism means that every claim about truth or morality is equally valid. And at first glance, you can kind of understand why someone might think postmodernism leads to that conclusion. After all, if truth is a function of goals, then there are no constraints on what can be true. Anything can be true if you pick the right goals. But that's completely backwards. Our goals are the only things that give us a reason to choose between different models in the first place. If you stop picking models that work, and start picking ones that tell you what you want to hear, you can't expect to achieve your goals. It's obvious why philosophers disdain this straw man version of relativism, and it shouldn't be surprising that postmodernists don't believe it either. Incidentally, this is also why the common charge that relativism is self-refuting doesn't actually mean much. It is fair to point out that relativism itself is only relatively true, but it's true relative to the goal of understanding the philosophical nature of knowledge. If that's your goal, you have to adopt the best tools available. In this case, those are the tools of logic and philosophy, and those tools point to relativism. You can't change the rules of the game just because you don't like the result. So what does relativism actually tell us? Well, all it really says is that truth and goodness can't be absolute. In other words, it simply doesn't make sense to imagine truth or goodness without someone with a reason to judge them. This is where that other definition of objectivity comes in, the one about perceiving facts without the influence of personal feelings or interpretations. And yes, postmodernism does tell us that this kind of objectivity is impossible. When we imagine that knowledge can be absolute, we rely on something called the all-seeing eye illusion. We have this fantasy of a being who knows everything but has no biases. Historically, that being was God, but now sometimes you'll hear people talk about aliens or far future humans with a perfect and complete scientific understanding of the universe. Either way, they're enough like us that we can imagine looking through their eyes, but somehow purified of our limitations and prejudices. All of our ideas about knowledge involve striving toward that pure, complete point of view. So when postmodernism tells us that perception requires us to apply our goals and self interest to the world, our instinct is to say, sure, maybe we need to do that to get started, but eventually we should be able to filter out the parts that reflect our biases and preconceptions and leave only the stuff that God, aliens, or the godlike humans of tomorrow would also see as true. Postmodernism doesn't tell us this is an ideal that's out of reach because humans are flawed and imperfect creatures. It tells us that the whole framework is misguided, 
We can improve our knowledge relative to what we knew before, but we can only compare the two by looking at old ideas through our new lens. And it only makes sense to call it an improvement because it's better at achieving our goals. Relativism doesn't mean all claims to truth or goodness are equally valid. We can make meaningful comparisons between positions on science or morality. But when we make those comparisons, we're judging two animal understandings against each other, not against an imaginary being who knows everything there is to know, but has no reason to know anything. If you came into this video with some prior knowledge of postmodernism, you might be surprised about how I've chosen to present it. I've intentionally ignored the disagreement and dense terminology that postmodernism is famous for. But I suspect that for some of you, the most surprising thing is that I've placed so much emphasis on evolution. A lot of people think of postmodernism as an alternative to evolutionary explanations of human behavior. And evolutionary theory wasn't a major influence on the philosophers we typically think of as postmodernists. So why did I present these ideas as though they're fundamentally linked? It's because what we know as postmodernism today is really just a stunted offshoot of a rich intellectual history scattered across a dozen disciplines and schools of thought. The philosophies of Foucault, Derrida, or Deleuze are only pieces of a larger whole we can only put together in retrospect. Now we can finally combine their ideas with concepts from pragmatism, cultural evolution, cognitive science, and perception theory. My take on that conceptual integration is obviously not the only one, or necessarily the best one, and it's mostly just meant to illustrate how well these pieces fit together. If you're one of the people who has put in the work to read Baudrillard or Lyotard, you might not think what I'm calling postmodernism bears all that much resemblance to their philosophy. In fact, you might even think it's misleading to call them by the same name. Why not give my version a new name, like evolutionary epistemology? That kind of grouping is a matter of personal judgment, and no matter how you draw the lines, there will always be similarities between groups and differences within them. Personally, I think there's good reason to think that in this case, the similarities matter more than the differences. Relativism may not be the only defining element of classic postmodernism, but it is the one that made it so controversial and influential. There's obviously an audience for in-depth videos on specific theoretical constructs like Deleuze's rhizome or Derrida's difference. I just can't help but think that this isn't the sort of answer most people are looking for when they ask what postmodernism is all about. What they really want is for someone to show them how positions that sound as strange and counterintuitive as relativism and social constructivism can actually make any sense. Relativism and social constructivism are also the aspects of postmodernism that draw the most ire from people like the intellectual dark web. I didn't single out the intellectual dark web as the nemesis of postmodernism just because they insist on scapegoating it for any political positions they don't like. It's also because many of them loudly insist that evolution disproves relativism. That's why there are so many evolutionary psychologists in the intellectual dark web. They mistakenly think that evolution can somehow make perception true, and by extension, human knowledge can be absolute. Even worse, they go on to imply that evolution specifically debunks the political positions they dislike most. An evolutionary approach to relativism attacks that whole misguided train of thought at the root. It doesn't oversimplify complex questions about the appropriate role of scientific authority or the interactions of genes and culture in phenomena like gender or race, but it does give us a robust framework for exploring those questions. And while it might put things in slightly different terms, it's a framework that echoes the relativist, constructivist positions of classic postmodernism. Where evolutionary thinking does depart from classic postmodernism, it usually does so by clarifying and extending its core ideas, not contradicting them. For instance, it transcends the anthropocentrism of postmodern ideas in literary theory, like death of the author, by showing that human knowledge is relative because humans are animals and animal knowledge is relative. It's also just a lot more familiar and intuitive than the convoluted mass of theory that birthed postmodernism in the first place. But while it might be different in a lot of superficial ways, in my mind, it's just a better way to get to the same destination. Now that we have a clearer idea of what postmodernism actually is, we can respond to the criticisms made by Peterson and the intellectual dark web directly. They make two broad accusations. The first is that postmodern philosophy opened a Pandora's box of absurd identity politics. The most important example is the claim that postmodern deconstructions of gender gave people the idea to be transgender. Postmodernism does tell us that gender is socially constructed, but it says the same thing about literally everything. Social constructivism is universal. It gives us no special guidance on politicized topics like gender. 
So when feminist theorists started to explore how gender was socially constructed, there was no way to tell where that would lead. All feminists rejected traditional gender roles in some form, but there was initially no consensus about what should replace them or even what gender actually was. Some theorists concluded that all genders were valid, including trans and non-binary ones. But others became convinced that gender was a category invented to oppress women. And if that was the case, it wasn't possible for people to be genuinely trans. So the gender abolitionists decided that good feminism meant embracing transphobia. Through a long, painful, and still ongoing process of debate and activism, the second group has been almost completely discredited, and trans rights have become a core component of modern feminism. Now, this is obviously a very truncated version of a contentious and diverse conversation. But what matters for our purposes is that it wasn't consulting the principles of postmodern philosophy that settled the question. The relevant questions had nothing to do with postmodernism and everything to do with the values of the feminist community. I think that makes it pretty clear that the idea that trans people are the product of postmodernism is a conservative myth people like Jordan Peterson propagate to discredit trans identities. Postmodernism was created during the civil rights movement, and a lot of scholars did apply their philosophical tools to political causes. Derrida famously used deconstruction to attack apartheid. And in some applications of postmodernism, like the theories of rape culture, gender performativity, and postcolonialism, it can be hard to separate the political issues from the philosophical tools developed to study them. But the fact is that postmodernism didn't create any of these issues. It just provided a new way to understand them. The second accusation is trickier. It says that postmodern relativism requires us to adopt radical multiculturalism, the idea that we need to respect other cultures even if they seem disgusting or evil to us. Here's an example from a recent hit piece on postmodernism published in the intellectual dark web affiliated REO magazine. Quote, Common social constructions viewed as intrinsically problematic and thus claimed to be in need of dismantling include the understanding that so-called Western medicine is superior to traditional healing practices, and that Western liberal cultural norms which grant women and LGBT people equal rights are ethically superior to non-Western cultures that do not. In other words, the ARIA writers think social constructivism means we're not allowed to judge any beliefs held by people in other cultures, even if they're actively harmful. This is a big problem for them, and it would be an equally big problem for progressives. Fortunately for everyone, it's entirely possible to be a relativist and still be insufferably judgmental. The idea expressed in the ARIO piece is a common misunderstanding of relativism. It's closely related to the idea that relativism means all morals are equally valid and no judgment is possible, but it gives postmodernists a little bit more credit. It admits that postmodernists believe morals can be valid, but their validity only extends to the group of people that believe in them. It paints postmodernism as a when-in-Rome model of truth. And again, this is close enough that it kind of feels fair. The one-line version of the postmodern model of knowledge is, knowledge is social, so it seems intuitive to think knowledge would only extend to the bounds of a society. But remember that when we say society, we're not talking about the group or even the individuals. We're talking about a network of ideas and goals shared through both cultural and genetic inheritance. It's a subtle distinction, but a very important one. Truth in relativism isn't a popularity contest. It isn't even a product of the dominant mores of a particular time or place. It's relative to goals. And because a lot of human goals are products of our biology, they're universal across all cultures. Indigenous and Western cultures might have very different ideas about what health and nutrition mean and how best to achieve them, but they're obviously trying to solve the same problems. And those shared goals allow us to translate ideas between systems that otherwise understand the world in very different terms. The history of vaccination provides a useful example. Smallpox inoculation is thought to have been invented in China. They used scabs from the noses of infected people to prime the immune systems of people who hadn't been exposed to the disease. They believed those scabs contained sprouts of the disease which could be implanted in healthy people, making them safe from future infection. In India, the inoculant was understood to be a seed that mixed with a person's blood, and it was delivered in conjunction with an invocation of the goddess Shitala, who personified the disease. Europeans never came up with the idea on their own. It was introduced to the European medical community in the 1700s by an African slave in Boston and by British travelers visiting Turkey. As you might imagine, a lot of people were initially hesitant to intentionally infect their children with smallpox just because the Africans or Turks did it. But initial trials were so obviously effective that it was quickly adopted. And the really remarkable thing is that it wasn't until almost 200 years later that medical science discovered viruses and started to understand how vaccines actually work. Europeans didn't need to be convinced that the specific claims of the Turkish or African theories of inoculation were true. 
They didn't even need to be able to translate them into a more scientific language. They just needed to be looking for a way to stop smallpox. At first glance, it might seem like that solution only works for the few cases where different cultures are explicitly setting out to achieve the same thing. In contrast, the idea that social constructivism prevents us from condemning the way non-Western cultures treat women and LGBT people rests on the assumption that two groups hold mutually exclusive goals. The ARIO writers are obviously a bit optimistic to imply that the West is united behind LGBT rights, but no matter who actually belongs to them, there are obviously two factions here. Some people believe gay people should have rights, and other people want to take those rights away. So we seem to be at an impasse. From within, each group thinks its moral truths are true, and anything that contradicts them must be false. But this time, we can't settle the issue by asking which truth is better at achieving the goal both groups share. The goal of protecting gay rights is inextricable from the moral truth that gay people should have rights. The difference between the groups seems fundamental. But is it really? Homophobes aren't predators who can only survive by drinking gay blood. Gay people want their rights protected for the same reason everyone else does. But what do homophobes stand to lose if the government forces them to respect gay rights? Well, they worry that people might sin and go to hell, that encouraging one sin might lead people to flaunt more important rules, or even that God might punish all of us for disrespecting him. The fact that we can even answer this question tells us something useful. It tells us that homophobia isn't an end in itself. It's just one part of a package-deal moral worldview people cling to because they believe it's the only way to protect their friends and family from eternal damnation. And while that belief is deeply ingrained, it's not unconditional. We can show people that homophobia and transphobia cause a tremendous amount of human suffering and don't seem to do anything good. Plenty of churches have realized that ostracizing LGBT people is inconsistent with the core values of Christianity. Those arguments didn't work because it's an absolute moral truth that homophobia is bad. They worked because they successfully appealed to the universal fears and desires and moral intuitions that drive people to embrace religious beliefs in the first place. Those universal sentiments give us a shared context to argue about what moral truths we should believe. So, contrary to what the ARIA writers seem to think, there's nothing about postmodern relativism that keeps us from judging other people's beliefs. But they're not the first ones to make this particular mistake, and it's not a coincidence that people keep making it. The thing is, criticizing other cultures requires a pretty delicate touch. It's easy to slip into chauvinism, close-mindedness, and even xenophobia. That's what multiculturalism is for. It really doesn't have anything to do with postmodernism, relativism, or social constructivism at all. It's just a reminder that it's usually best to let people do whatever they want, except when it comes to the few things that really matter, like human rights. In Western cultures, it's basically a restatement of traditional liberal values like freedom of speech, association, and religion. And that's what makes it a liability for the intellectual dark web. They love Western liberal values so much that they constantly indulge in chauvinism and even xenophobia on their behalf. But if multiculturalism is one of those Western values, violating it makes them look like hypocrites. Of course, they could own up to the fact that they're rejecting part of the tradition they claim to support. But it's a whole lot easier if they just pretend it came from postmodernism instead. Maybe it's a pipe dream, but I think it would be cool if people respected postmodernism enough that that strategy didn't work. So I'm not asking you to buy a hat and start calling yourself a postmodernist. I don't really even care if you want to call these ideas by a completely different name. I just want you to take them seriously. Postmodernism very well may be the philosophy that makes the most sense for your worldview, and I don't think that should be casually dismissed. 